This is the Infinite Eleven's Anatomy of Horror, a video series dedicated to spotlighting the best filmmakers in the horror genre, both past and present. Film is a language, so by carefully dissecting and analyzing the work of some of the most talented technicians, we peel back the curtain on their method and hopefully teach as well as learn more about this amazing medium. So tonight, we're gonna talk about one of the most iconic and successful thrillers ever made, The Silence of the Lambs, written by Ted Talley and directed by Jonathan Demme. That's coming up next. <laughs> the Silence of the Lambs follows Agent Clary Starling, a young, intelligent, and ambitious FBI trainee in the pursuit of a serial killer dubbed Buffalo Bill. As Bill becomes more confident and more prolific, the FBI is at a loss for leads. So Clarice seeks the help of Dr. Hannibal Lecter, a brilliant psychologist and cunning serial killer, housed at a maximum security hospital for the criminally insane. This film has stood the test of time. It's an absolute classic and for good reason. It was exceptionally well made. Every element is practically flawless and it all comes together to create this singular vision that others have tried to copy, but never able to replicate. The Silence of the Lambs is a masterclass in writing, directing, acting, cinematography, and editing. And before I get into these facets of the film, I'd like to ask that if you enjoy these videos, and we have quite a few now, to please like the video and subscribe to our channel. It would really help us to continue on. So let's start with Jonathan Demme's style. And let me tell you, it is incredibly consistent and overwhelmingly effective. At the heart of the film is the story of a young, intelligent woman, Clarice Starling, Immersed in a world dominated by men, she works harder and smarter than her peers because she has to. Above all else, all Clarice wants is to be respected, but she is constantly underestimated, sexualized, and looked down upon. So to tell the story on film, Demi chooses a very, very personal style. It does not get any more subjective than this, and that, I believe, is the defining characteristic of this film. These long patterns of close-ups, and many times extreme close-ups, with very shallow focus where the character is looking either directly into the lens or almost right into the lens. And the crazy thing is, it doesn't break the fourth wall, meaning that it never shatters the illusion of the film's world by reminding us that we are watching a movie. In fact, it does the opposite. In most films, when we see a subjective pattern emerge, there is often an objective shot thrown into the pattern to balance the personal with the impersonal. And rarely ever do we see the character stare right into the lens. Demi threw that convention out the window and gives us these long scenes where we only get more and more subjective with no objective cutaways, and it gives the effect that we are voyeuristically experiencing exactly what the character, usually Clarice, is experiencing. This does two things. In the first act, it introduces us to Clarice, while at the same time letting us empathize with her plight. The second thing it does is when we get deeper into the story, it increases the tension in dialogue heavy scenes, especially involving Hannibal Lecter. This incredible personal style ends up being balanced, but not by the impersonal, but by more subjectivity, the POV, or the point of view shot. Not only do we get to look directly in the eyes of a killer and directly in the eyes of our protagonist, we get to see what she sees from her own point of view. Usually the POV is used sparingly because its style is so personal that if overused can have a jarring effect. That is not the case here, and it works incredibly well. And that's because our eyes have become accustomed to the subjective style. And by adding in these point of view shots, we get the entire experience of walking in Starling shoes, and it never feels odd or out of place. Even the objective revelatory shots or omniscient point of view have a personal feel to them. And that's because the camera movement is consistent throughout the entire film. In this shot right here, early in the first act, we follow closely behind Starling, and the effect is that we are walking too. Now look at the shot right here when we explore Buffalo Bill's home for the very first time. The movement is eerily similar, and though this shot is not from anyone's point of view, it feels like it is. It feels personal, like we aren't supposed to be here, and this works because the style has already been established. And finally, as far as the film's intense subjective style, Demi and director of photography, Tak Fujimoto, use a really cool technique to signify that a character has a breakthrough moment. These quick dolly shots that start as a medium shot on a character and then push into a close-up to show their reaction to a new set of information. This is used when Clarice puts together pieces of an investigation or when Agent Crawford realizes someone close to him is in trouble and is also used when Hannibal Lecter is up to something nefarious or is plotting something awful. 
But this extremely personal style would not be able to work without its use of establishing shots. An establishing shot is used in practically every film. It's a super wide, deep focus shot of a city, building, or house used to orient the audience to where the characters are. In The Silence of the Lambs, the establishing shot is used liberally. That's because they were extremely important to support its almost first-person style narrative. We spend the bulk of the film in these tight shots. So to do this effectively, we need a visual landmark of where our characters are to be fully immersed into the story. For example, this shot right here, we see a car driving down a West Virginia road and then right into a subjective shot and notice how well it works. Another example here is the first time we see Baltimore State Forensic Hospital, where Lecter stays for the first time. Then we go right into a tight close-up of Dr. Chilton, meeting him for the very first time. In most films, they take their time getting to the subjective, start with an ultra-wide establishing shot of a house, and then cut to a wide shot of an office where two people talk, then go in a little closer to a medium shot before ultimately getting personal. But Demi skips all that and to phenomenal results. But he's able to do this by using his establishing shots. And these ultra wide shots are not only to orient us geographically, but look closer and you'll see that nearly every one of them hold either a phallic or eunuch symbol to further the themes of patriarchy as well as female empowerment. But we'll get to that in a minute. Now onto the central character, Agent Clary Starling. This is her story and the way in which Demi films her is deliberate symbolism. And just like every other aspect of the film is so consistent. The very first shot of the film, we are shown a forest thick with fog. Then we pan to the left into a wide shot of Clarice climbing up a difficult portion of an obstacle course. So right away, we are told that Clarice is alone in a forest or in over her head and foreshadows her upcoming investigation in which she can't see the forest through the trees, so to speak. Even better, though we won't see Clarice in an actual forest again, Demi is constantly placing her in a forest on screen. Right from the get-go and throughout the film, when Clarice is photographed wide on screen with other people, she is dwarfed by them, as if she is surrounded by a forest of people, her fellow trainees, mostly men, literally tower over her. This not only reinforces Clarice's battle to stand out in the male-dominated world of the FBI, but it subconsciously sends a message to its viewer that Clarice Starling is in danger, which means that Jonathan Demi was setting up for the climax from the very first frame. There's even a shot in the second act where Clarice is momentarily pictured in the belly of a T-Rex, or better yet, in the belly of a beast. Also, let's go back to that first shot of Clarice climbing up the hill. I mentioned earlier the phallic and yonic symbolism used to visualize Clarice's journey. The composition here is clearly yonic, and as Starley climbs up the rope, she is fully burst into the scene. We're being told right away that not only is she in danger, but she is actively climbing uphill to overcome the stigma of being a woman. But there's something else to the shot. Look at these two mounds right here and look at the shape of it. Compare that to the shape later in the film. It's hard to imagine this being a happy accident. There were too many highly skilled and talented people working on the film for this to be anything other than fantastic symbolism in artistry. But back to the dirty stuff. This film is littered with phallic symbolism throughout, and here is a perfect example of how and why it pertains to Clarice. When we first see this hospital naturally from a low angle, the framing gives this tower right here precedence in the shot considering it's at the highest point. Once Clarice enters the warring world of Dr. Chilton and Hannibal Lecter, she suffers a massive indignity at the hands or hand of a patient at the hospital. So here we see her weeping under the intimidating phallic structure towering over her. This is a pattern that is repeated throughout the film's entirety. We often see phallic symbols shown in an establishing shot that either follows or sets up a scene where Clarice suffers an indignity. To contrast that, we often see many yonic symbols to signify a victory for Clarice or when she is in the act of empowering herself. So we know what Clarice is trying to overcome in her professional life, but her main struggle in her personal life is the death of her father when she was only a child. And she has two very important relationships in the film both father figures, Jack Crawford and Hannibal Lecter. Both relationships are painted on screen in very interesting ways. So let's start with Jack Crawford. The father-daughter angle is clear, and Jack even looks like her father. Right here, when Clarice and Jack head to perform an autopsy, Clarice sits in the back and photographed like a child, while Jack is shot like a parent in the front seat. When the two share the same shot together, they are close and comfortable, and this is reinforced through dialogue. But this shot in particular has a two peas in a pod feel to it, and that notion is also similar in this shot right here as well. Clarice's other father figure, Hannibal Lecter, is another story. 
And there's a really interesting visual pattern associated with Lecter that begins before we meet him. As soon as Clarice and Chilton exit his office, we see them framed within a series of square windows or converging lines. And that not only carries through to the next scene, but throughout the entirety of the sequence preceding Lecter's introduction. The scene that directly precedes Lecter, we are introduced to another pattern that also parallels Buffalo Bill, and that is the stone pattern on the walls in the dungeon-like area that Lecter and his fellow insane asylum brethren live. So this is it. We meet Hannibal Lecter, and look at how he's filmed. Notice the protective clear wall he is behind. Is it me or does it have a hamster cage feel to it? This makes sense since Lecter is being toyed with by Dr. Chilton, but we'll get to that in a second. Once Clarice is invited to sit down, class is in session, and a pattern develops between these two. Right away, we are cutting back and forth between Clarice and Lecter, and notice his eyes are higher in the frame, and he is filmed from a slightly lower angle, whereas Clarice's eyes are mid-frame, and she is filmed at a higher angle. Since this film is mostly from Clarice's point of view, this is how she sees Lecter a teacher and father figure, so he is given status in their interactions together and helps create chemistry between the two. Lecter sees himself a genius, and Clarice doesn't try to present herself as anything other than a young agent in need of tutelage. Now, this is later in the film, and notice now how Clarice is filmed and her blocking. She looks like a kindergarten student, but also notice that she now looks as though she is in a hamster cage, much like how we saw Lecter in the first time we meet him. This is because Clarice is also being toyed with to a certain degree. Jack Crawford is using her in a way not completely obvious to her, and Dr. Lecter is trying to get into her head. So now we see the two are filmed similarly, and this is to signify that there is a connection about to be established. Oh, Chloe, oh, I tell you things, you tell me things. So next week, we'll be following up with a part two, where we'll discuss how the pacing and style of the film are used to trick us in the final act, and I'll break down the filmmaking aspects of two scenes that are great representations of Demi's style. The Silence of the Lambs was directed by Jonathan Demme and starts Jodie Foster, Sir Anthony Hopkins, Scott Glenn, and Ted Levine. Until next time.